somebody praise him in the building. Ah, he's worthy of our praise this morning, isn't that right today? Glory to his name. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, God, and everything, God, that you bestowed upon us, God, today, just allowing us to be in the house of God, to worship you in spirit and truth. Bless every home and every family, God, that is here today. Father, I pray that be one of the sound of my voice that don't know you in their free pardon of sin. Father, today would be the day that you'd grip their soul that come around this altar of repentance give their life to you. And Father, the ones that may be here today, God, that may be discouraged along the way, Father, I pray, God, that you'd give them the peace that passes all understanding. And God, I pray, God, that you'd lift that burden, God, off their heart today. And Father, I pray, God, for the homes and the families that are representative, the extended families, God, that may not be here. And God, they're all issues and problems. God, you know, every problem, and I pray you'd meet those problems and Father, I pray you'd send a miracle to their life. Now, Father, I pray, God, for the preaching hour, the songs of Zion that stirs our soul, God, one more time this side of heaven. Now, Father, I pray, God, you bless everything that we do and all that we say and let it be for thy glory. In Christ's name we pray and God's people say it. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord praise as you're being seen. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus, aren't you? The blood of Jesus.
just play a few minutes of the song. While you're standing, we're getting ready to sing a song, and it says, sometimes it takes a mountain. I personally know of some folk that are in this room this morning that have gone through some awful hard valleys lately. Going through some difficult times. I'm thankful that there's help to be found in Jesus. Amen. When we can't fix it on our own, when we don't know how and don't know where we're going to turn, I'm thankful there's a God that already has it all worked out. There's a God that knows the end from the beginning. There's a God that we can trust. There's a God we can believe. And so I want to do this. I usually uh, wait till invitation uh, later, but we'll do this right now. Uh, while they sing, if you've got a burden, if you've got a need, maybe it'd be a good time and a good way to start this service down at the feet of Jesus. So while they sing, why don't we come? Here we come. Lord, I need your help today. I need hope. I need I've healing. faced the mountain oh, God. I never faced before. That's why I'm calling on your Lord. Yeah. I know it's been a while, but Lord, please hear my prayer. I need your life. I never have.
Isaiah 53 said uh, that in, in, by his stripes we are healed. I'm thankful not for a Baptist, not for a denomination, not for a plan or a program, but I'm thankful for a man named Jesus. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanseth us from all sin. Uh, I didn't get it in the baptistry. I didn't find it out somewhere else. I, I didn't find it in the Sunday school room. Nothing wrong with any, any of that. But I found it all uh, in the blood. I got it all when I got the blood on me. It took, hey, hey, it took it all off of me. I said, bless his name. We ought to rejoice about the blood that still saves I still the dark sinners and the blood that still sets the captive free. The blood, the blood, the blood this morning. Bless the Lord. Help us with that song while they sing. Come on, uh, Tanya, help us out. Your blood is red. Sin stained light. Your blood is healing for the hopeless and broken. Your
Aren't you glad? The blood of Jesus. It's more than enough. But I'm glad that he'll make a way when it seems to be no way. God, <laughs> it is a way I can testify to that. Can anybody testify that somehow or another you got in a jam somewhere along the line? Life came at you faster than you was expecting. Maybe disaster struck your home or physically. And all of a sudden, maybe the doctors had walked in. They didn't give you very good chances. And then all of a sudden, God made a way. Maybe your employer come in and said, today will be your last day. And before you got to the house, you'd already got another phone call. I'm glad whenever it seems like that life has thrown you a curve, I'm glad that God walks in, wiped the tears from our cheeks, put his arms around us, lets us know that everything's going to be all right, and that he's never left us, that he'd never forsake us. I'm glad. I serve a God like that this morning. I feel like just telling him how much we love him this morning. How good he's been to us. Because in the wee hours of the morning, preacher, I'm glad that he's put his arms around me and wiped the tears from my cheeks. I'm glad he's been my best friend. But all the rest of my friends have walked out. I'm glad that's the kind of God that we serve. We ought to praise him and give him. We ought to take time out. Let the devil know who saves. Give him praise all the time.
praise the Lord. If you have your Bible, uh, turn with it anywhere you want to. I don't know what I'm doing now. Uh, Acts chapter number two. Stand with us. Uh, those the kids and all that uh, go next door, uh, make your way over there. And we'll have a time of kids' church for them. I know that they'll appreciate that, enjoy that. Didn't you enjoy the music this morning? Now, uh, Dex has uh, volunteered you, Allison, to sing. And so uh, maybe at the end of this service, uh, we'll get you to sing before you leave. All right? Praise the Lord. How about not guilty? Can you do that one? I love that song. Amen. Uh, so we'll have that ready at the end of the service. Uh, Acts chapter number two. And. Uh, Look at verse number 36. This morning I'm going to be preaching um, a lot different style, I suppose, than I typically do. And, um, all right, there's the problem right there. All right, can we hear? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> We've got the microphones mixed up. Amen. Well, that'll work. <laughs> Acts chapter number two. I think, uh, this thing, brother, um, is showing up on the green. Is that, is that bouncing on the green? All right, so let me. Uh, Acts chapter number two. Take, take it out of the monitor. Just turn the monitor. Just mute the monitor. That'll work. Uh, Acts chapter number two. There we go. Can y'all hear me? All right. Acts chapter number two and verse number 36. Uh, the Bible said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the, that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ now when they heard this they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he uh, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly received uh, his word. Uh, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I want to call your attention back to verse number 39. Where Peter, preaching under the unction of the Holy Ghost, reminds the crowd he's preaching to uh, that the promise of God. Now he all, they already know they've crucified the Lord Jesus. His blood is on their hands, and they said it just before that. Let His blood be on our hands and our children's. And so Peter was moved by the Holy Ghost to preach to that same crowd this. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Let's pray together. Brother John, if you will, I want you to pray for us right now. We'll just stay on that. All right. It's all me. You can't take any vacations around here, bless the Lord. Uh, uh, we were able to go preach, and I, I appreciate all of you praying for us. Uh, the Lord helped us uh, over this past week, and we certainly do appreciate that. Acts chapter number two here is very familiar. Uh, Jesus, in chapter number one, told them, said, stay in Jerusalem 
until you be endued with power. And uh, the, the angels there said, why well, stand you here gazing this same Jesus that kind of left here is coming again in like manner. Let me just go ahead and say this. He's still coming again. Amen. One of these days, he's going to split open the eastern skies. He's coming back just like he said. I'm glad, hallelujah, because one of these days, I'm going over yonder with him. I'm going home with me with him. Somebody ought to give him some praise about that. He told them to stay in Jerusalem until uh, you be endued with power uh, from on high. And so as we uh, begin to think about that, they're, the, they're staying there uh, where, where they're at. And then the Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, then the Holy Spirit came and in, in filled them, empowered them. Uh, they began to, to preach. And the Bible said that every man heard in his own language. There are people gathered from all over the place there, and they began to preach, and everybody heard in their own language. And then uh, uh, in that uh, preaching, uh, Peter is preaching, and of course we know uh, that here that uh, thousands are saved, 3,000 according to uh, verse number 41, uh, get saved here in this message uh, after hearing the, the word and the, the preached word of God to repent. Uh, by the way, God's still calling all men everywhere to repent. That's not a message you'll hear a whole lot in a whole lot of churches, uh, but it is a message of the gospel. It's the message of this book. It is that repent. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In verse number 3, he said that. Turned around and said it again in verse number 5. Yea, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Uh, and let... <laughs> We say it like this, turn or burn. Uh, there, there's got to be a change in your life. Uh, if you say, well, preacher, I went down to an altar and I said a little prayer and God never done nothing. There's never been a change in your life. Uh, I would wonder, is there a change in my eternity? Uh, there's got to be a repentance in your heart uh, toward the things of God. God bursts in you the new birth uh, and you are made a brand new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. So as we, we think about that, I, I, I was talking to a friend of mine, and we were having the discussion, and God, he said something that just stuck with me, and I've not been able to let it loose, and I, I felt like this is the message that I'm supposed to bring to you. I want to preach a little while on kingdom connections. Kingdom connections. In verse number 39, the Bible said, The promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Numbers chapter number 6 says it like this. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his son, saying, On this wise ye shall Bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. Over in the New Testament we find where uh, the Bible said that John had some disciples uh, that were following him. John the Baptist had disciples that were following him. One of the disciples' name was Andrew. The Bible said that he went and found, uh, that he went and found his brother, Peter, and said, we found the Christ. Then the Bible said that uh, Jesus is preaching and they run across a guy by the name of Philip. And Philip uh, hears the word of God and Jesus calls to him, follow me. And the Bible said this, that Philip went and found Nathanael and said, we found him whom Moses and the law and the prophets speak 
uh, come and see. And he said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He said, come and see. And I'll tell you this. If you have questions about the Lord Jesus, if you have questions about what this Bible has to say, I'll just tell you like they said, come and see. Come see a man that told me all things ever I did. Come see one that saw me when I was unlovable. That saw me when I was out of the way. And bless his name, he made a change in my life. He's made a change in the lives of those around Around you as well, but he said, Come and see this man. Amen. Then Jesus said to Nathaniel, as he's on his way, He said, Behold, an Israelite indeed is whom no guile. And Nathaniel was struck by that. He said, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before the before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. He already knows where you're at. Yeah. Long time before you ever landed on church view, he knew exactly where you were at. He, he knew where you were last night. He knew where you were last week. Amen. In fact, whenever you were born, he already knew the end from the beginning. Now that'll blow your mind when you get to thinking about it. But our God's a big old God, uh, and He's higher than the, uh, as the Bible said this in Isaiah 55, I believe it is. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are His ways uh, above our ways. Uh, they are past figuring out, they're past finding out. Uh, but I'm God, I'm glad, glad I got a God uh, uh, that's bigger than me. Uh, I got a God that goes before me. Uh, he's a way making God. Uh, he's a God that puts the pieces in place. Uh, he's the God that knows uh, what He's doing. He said this. Jesus answered and said, "Because." I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou. Thou shalt see greater things than these. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so, begin to think about how that God puts people together. How that God, even in this story here in the Gospels, as he starts to call his disciples, he starts having connections. One went and got his brother, and then they went and got another one. And little did they know that connection would change the trajectory of their entire life and eternity. And I got to thinking about that. I'll tell you a story. Some of you may have heard this name. Many of you may not be familiar with it. But in 1858, there was a guy by the name of Edward. Edward Kimball was his name. He was a Sunday school teacher, and uh, the way that he led his class is he would uh, go to each individual student he had at some point and give them a personal invitation and a personal opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior. He was burdened about one of his students, and so he went to where this student was working. The student was stocking shoes uh, to, to make a little extra money, and he went down to the shoe store and called, and was, they allowed him to go back into the back there, and he began to, to deal with him, and that young man that he dealt with personally that day, his name was Dwight. Some of you may have heard of Dwight L. Moody. Uh, that was Dwight L. Moody that Edward Kimball, his Sunday school teacher, led to the Lord. Well, Moody, as you, some of you may know, Moody became an internationally known evangelist. It is said of Moody that he took England in one hand and America in the other hand and shook two continents for Christ. Uh, he was used mightily. Well, in the... Um, process of his evangelistic work, a young man by the name of Frederick Meyer, or if you'd like to read commentaries, F.B. Meyer, I heard what he was doing and that his ministry so impacted him that he wanted to uh, model his ministry after D.L. Moody. So he began to go and preach, and he was preaching in Massachusetts, 
Uh, and he said this word, if you're not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing in his message? When he said that, a young man by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman was pierced in the heart about the call of God on his life. And he began uh, to try to be and do evangelism work. He had a guy that came to help him as he began to work in crusades. He was an old baseball player, and his name was Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday had a, had a strange ministry. Uh, in, in fact, he was used mightily uh, do that right at the turn of the century uh, to bring about prohibition in America. Uh, I'm not here to get in on politics or anything like that, but I will simply say this. I've never found where alcohol and, and liquor and wine and all that has ever done one good thing for a family. I've never found one time I where it's a, a good thing for anybody to be involved in the regular consumption of all that. And you say, well, preacher, don't you go messing with that. I've got that for when I get sick. And the Bible did say, say that if you were sick, that you could take a little bit. That ought to speak to you uh, that if you've got to have it all the time, you're sick. Yeah. Amen. It comes right there. He, Billy Sunday, was preaching and many, many, many souls came to Christ. Billy Sunday had a, uh, an outreach and a crusade that a group of Christian men from Charlotte, North Carolina, decided, we're going to do what he's doing. None of us, none of them were preachers. Men, listen. Not one of them were preachers. None of them were the evangelists that were, whose name was in the light. They just decided what they're doing, we got to bring it here. God give us some men that would say, I don't care about what everybody else is doing. I want to get in on what God's doing. I want to get in on what how God's working, and I'm going to get involved in that. I'm going to bring uh, God and the power of God and the touch of God into my home, into my community, into my church. The sad reality is this, uh, Brother Pittman, uh, you told me I believe you're 83 years old. The sad reality in 2021 is this. We, we have a, a failure. We have a, a lack of of men who will stand and do what God has called them to do. We've got a lot of, a whole lot of people that are willing to sit on the sidelines and watch somebody else do it, but that's just not my job. I work 40 hours a week. I work 50, 60 hours a week, and thank God for it. The Bible tells us it's good to do that, but it's also the better part is to find yourself at the feet of Jesus. That, that wasn't in the message. So. <laughs> they, uh, they employed a man by the name of Mordecai Ham to come and preach that crusade in Charlotte, North Carolina. Most of you already know the rest of the story. He preached the crusade and a young man, a teenager, came night after night under conviction of the Holy Ghost. That young man gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ. His name was Billy Graham. Kingdom Connections. It all started because somebody did what they were supposed to do. Somebody got the gospel. There's probably someone in this room that was saved from a result of the ministry that come through that line of people. It might not have been at a Billy Graham crusade, but it may have been that somebody that won you to Christ was won through that. And so we get begin to think about that. And I, I thought, how, how does God put all this together? And how does God work in the hearts and lives of, of, of people? I told you this message is a little different. This is uh, what they taught us in Bible college. It's called a conversational style message. Uh, I'm going to tell you another story. 
there was a, a guy who grew up in the hills of, uh, up in the mountains and his daddy was a drunk. This would have been probably in the 50s, somewhere in that time frame. His mom worked several jobs, raised five children. The dad was in and out, up and down, never could get, uh, count on him to do anything that, or to even be there. And as growing up, that man said, as a little boy, I said to myself, I'll never be like that, only to end up just like that. A drunk, on drugs, in and out of jail, called his mom at the end of his rope. Somehow they got him out of jail and he was on probation. And after that he said, you know, there's got to be more to life than this. Can I say this? If you're going through that cycle this morning, if you're going through that cycle of life, oh, there's so much more to, to life than that. You can have life, and the Bible said, have life more abundantly. You don't have to keep on going through the circle, going through the routine, going through all that. God has deliverance for you. God has a better plan for you. God has great days ahead for you if you'll just throw in with him. He thought, there's got to be more to life than this. Somehow, he found himself in a church Sunday morning. The preacher was preaching. Man, he was under conviction. But like many, he would not move. He held on to the back of that pew. Wouldn't go. He said, God got to dealing with him so much, he went back. They had a service that night, and they went back. And in the process, right before he went to church, that preacher told him, went through the plan of salvation. He had heard it. His mama told him about it. And he called on the name of Jesus. And when he went back to church that night, he went and told that preacher, I didn't get saved this morning, preacher, but right before I came, hey, hey, right before I came over here tonight, I bowed my head and I asked Jesus into my heart and God began to do a work and began to do a change in his life. He had a, he had a live-in girlfriend and he, he went home and said, honey, what we're doing ain't right. We can't live like we've been living and uh, well, something's going to have to happen. Well, she went to church and she got saved. Then they got married. Amen. First comes love, then comes marriage, then it comes a baby carriage. Amen. Uh, they got married, and then she, she, she would have found herself expected. The probation officer came by, and they still, you know, just now getting started. Things are kind of rough. They're pretty poor. He spent a whole lot of money on drugs and alcohol, and that'll keep you real poor. Amen. You know, there's blessings in living for God. But whenever you, you quit throwing your money away into all that stuff, there's other blessings that come along with that. Amen goes right there. And uh, they had that little boy. And the probation officer, it was his job to come and show up again. And he came and he went and looked and in the crib lay this little, little boy. And I mean, just everything was nice and neat and tidy. He had little toys and those little spin around things, all that stuff. Y'all ladies know what I'm talking about. Mobile. That's it. That's it. That's it. Mobile. And uh, had a little Bible tucked up in his crib. And the probation officer said, I, I don't understand this. You was a drunk. You was a druggie. You was strung out. You was a hippie. Now you got a haircut, you got nice clothes, you got a nice home. Your wife is uh, uh, dressed nice here. She, uh, uh, Y'all are getting along fine. Your baby's laying with a Bible in the crib. And he told him, man, I got saved uh, and God's been working in my life. God's been doing a change in me. He actually later answered the call to preach, started pastoring a church, raised two boys of his own, adopted a girl, adopted another boy later in life, well, you may, you may, you may know this name. His name was Kenny Townsend. His son's names are Brian and C.T. Townsend. What the Bible calls was a buzz. 
I'm telling you, God makes kingdom connections. There are people sitting in this room, or, or maybe they're over there now, that got saved through that ministry of that kingdom connection. I'll share this last little story with you. My Uncle Ray lived with us. My Uncle Ray is six years older than me. My Uncle Ray was more like a big brother than an uncle, but an uncle enough that we loved him, but a brother enough that we got on his nerves real bad. And uh, one time he got a brand new Tar Heels football. And right beside our house, we had an empty lot there. And uh, those wild onions would grow in that empty lot. Well, we didn't have no football to play with one day. And he wasn't there. And his football was there. And we thought, this is perfect. Here's a football, Jehovah Jireh. I didn't know that term back then. God has provided. We went in there, went in his room, took that football out of the, it was in a, 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 a carton of some sort, a display carton. We took it out of there. We, we played football with it. We, we ran, we tackled it. We, we, we was in the onions. And if you know anything about the onions, they smell real bad, but they leave green streaks. We didn't think nothing about it. We were done with it. It was still a football. We stuck it. <laughs> we stuck it right back in there. I mean, look in factory what I'm talking about. Just like it came, we thought. And man, was he mad when he found out what we had done with his football. But my Uncle Ray, when he got to be about a teenager or so, he started liking this girl. They went to church a whole lot. And so... He had, he had gotten saved as a younger man. I think he was about 10 or 11 when he got saved. And he started going to church with them. Then he ended up marrying her. And so we got involved in that family just through him. Well, my brother wanted to learn to play the guitar. And don't he do a good job with that? Amen. Amen. Uh, the, the lady that he married, she could sure enough play the hound dog out of the guitar. And she offered him some lessons about playing the guitar. And so he started doing that. Just because he's going over the snare so much, I, I got a guitar too. Y'all ain't never seen me make my G chord on the guitar, have you? Amen. I tell you what, I can make a strong G chord. Amen. And, uh, but uh, we started going over there and then we started going to church with them as young, young boys. And after a while of going to church, God started dealing with us. God started drawing us. And we, my brother and I, on April 2nd, 1989, bowed our head in the backseat of a 1987 Mazda 323 and got born again down at the cruiser's turnaround at Myrtle School Road and Franklin Boulevard. God made a change in my life. Well, that church that we were going to, they didn't have a Wednesday night service. And after a while, I started getting close to God, and I wanted to get closer to God, so I wanted to go to church more. I got a real problem for people all the time looking for reasons not to go to the house of God. Hebrews chapter number 10 tells us uh, that we ought to assemble ourselves uh, together and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And there's some folk all the time looking for an excuse not to be in the house of God. <laughs> so I started, I, I was listening to preaching on the radio. Mays Jackson was one that I liked to listen to. My uncle turned me on him with the truck drivers or something. And now here's your friend and mine, Brother Mays. Brother Mays. Amen. That's my best, Brother Mays. Uh, but there were some preachers in, uh, on that radio station I started listening to. And one of them used to pastor this church back when it was over yonder. And I, I said, man, I'd like to go hear him. And so on Wednesday nights, about 1995, 
1996 time frame, I started coming and visiting. Well, what before very long, May of 1996 rolled around. And we were going to have homecoming. How many of you know when you have homecoming, you bring all the food and you invite all, all the people and all that? It was homecoming Sunday morning. Service was getting ready to start. And the church split right down the middle. Let me just pause. Thank God that God had my eyes on him and not them. Don't allow yourself to be used by Satan to cause splits and confusion and hurt and heartache. I've, told, I've heard stories of fights breaking out in church. God help us. We're supposed to be different than the bar, ain't we? We're supposed to love each other. Then the Bible say, you'll know you're my disciples by what? Your love for the bread. Anyway. So, after that happened, I'm going somewhere, y'all just hold on. After that happened, I said, well, I guess we'll visit a couple of the churches. I'd already been visiting Maranatha. I felt like that's where I should be. I said, well, let's, let's visit around me and my brother. Drove up to hear a preacher that we listened to on the radio. We drove up up in the mountains just to go one time. We, we did that. Visited a couple churches in the area. God led me here in 1996. My brother and I, Shannon, uh, led us here in 1996 when we began to start attending here. Jason and Shannon got married in that old building that was on the blue carpet and all that. And soon they had a little boy and they raised him here. Now he's off helping lead ministry at another church. And I, man, I miss him a whole lot, but I'm proud of him. Thankful uh, that God was using him. And uh, 1998, I answered the call to preach. Over there, I can take you. We took up the stage and the carpet and all that. But I can take you to the exact spot where God done a work in my life. And right after that, Kelly and I started talking. And Kelly went to a church up in about an hour and a half. I had to go about six counties to find somebody that would marry me. And uh, <laughs> she went to a church up there and Dr. Larry Brown would come and preach revival at their church. I'd never heard of him before. Uh, but I met several people there. I met uh, Randy Davis there. Randy Davis, him and his family have ministered here for over four years. Hundreds were saved during their time of ministry here at our church because of a kingdom connection that was made, because of what God was doing. And I, I met uh, Dr. Brown through there, and I knew that that's where I was supposed to go to Bible college after I prayed about it for a little while, and God told me that's where I was supposed to go. I remember I can take you to the, uh, to the Chinese restaurant you should know that I'm telling you something that's got something to do with a buffet or something like that. Uh, me and Dr. Hurt, I, I asked him, could he meet with me, counsel me, and help me? And we met at a Chinese restaurant at the Ming Yat in uh, North Augusta, South Carolina. I told him about y'all. Well, I didn't, it wasn't all about y'all, because some of y'all wasn't here yet. Not that I knew of, but God knew. Think about that a minute. That was way back in Bible college. So I, so, some of you was moved off somewhere else. Some of you was uh, involved in another church then, but God knew that 2021 would be here, and God knew you'd be sitting right where you're sitting. That blows my mind. But I sat with Dr. Hurt, and I said, should I go and pastor this church? And he gave me some words of encouragement, some words of warning, and he said, I, I, I believe it'd be the will of God for you to go and uh, pastor there and find out what God wants. And so if he would have told me that day, no, don't do that, y'all wouldn't have me as a pastor today. But he told me, I think that's, that'd be the will of God 
let, let's, and I'm not just trying to listen to man, but the Bible said well, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You find some people that are hooked up with God, some people that are wise in the things of God, that know something about the will of God, and if they're all warning you against what you're getting ready to do, it'd be real good for you to listen to them and say, I don't want to make that choice. And so, I started a pastor here. I was ordained from Victor Baptist Church, Dr. Larry Brown and Dr. Hurt. Uh, we, they, they were part of the ordination. I met a man by the name of Kenny Marr there that was uh, a student, then he became an instructor. And God has used him uh, to be a blessing to, to us, to our church. And in that Peace Haven connection, there's a guy by the name of Gary Cottle. Gary's been here a couple times with his family. And he, there was an opportunity several years back that said, Brother Sean Tab was, you know, in the area, and I didn't know him. I didn't know who he was, anything about him. And I called Gary. I said, Gary, tell me about this guy. He said, he ain't going to hurt you. Uh, he said, you, you, can, you should have him in. And I did, and from that day to this day, he's been a tremendous encouragement, him and his family, to our church, to me. There's, some, there's several that are sitting in this room right now uh, that have been able to minister to many others through the outreach of those guys that I told you about. Preacher, why are you telling me this? What I'm telling you is this. If you're a piece on the ch chessboard, God will move you here and he'll move you there. He'll move people into your life. Sometimes he moves people out of our lives. God knows exactly what he's doing. God saw all of what you're going through and what you're going to long before you ever got there. He told him, said, before you ever got to me, I saw you sitting under that tree. He said, you, you, <laughs> That blows your mind that you think I can see that. He said, but listen to what I'm getting ready to tell you. You're getting ready to see the Son of Man and uh, angels descending and ascending on him. Uh, you ain't, it'll blow your mind if you think about the future that lays ahead of you. I'm here to tell you, child of God, God has a way of making kingdom connections in your life. But what you need to do, what I need to do, what we need to do is be sure we're connected connected to the things God wants us to be connected to. Number one, we need to be connected to the salvation that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll not find salvation in anything or anywhere else. It's only found in the Lord Jesus Christ, His shed blood. If you do not know without a doubt that you're saved today, that's the first connection you need to make. You need to be connected to the will of God in your life. God, am I in your will? Am I doing what you want me to do? Am I doing what you would have me to do? Now, Miss Fraley, Miss Fraley is, uh, she's just a little bit older than I am. Just, just a smidge. And uh, I learned you don't talk about ladies' age, but she's just a little bit more wise than I am. Miss Fraley, though, I believe with all my heart that if God told Miss Fraley, it's my will for you to do this and to stop doing that, then you would go to doing what God told you to do and quit even. Somebody said this. We ought to be willing to leave our mistake no matter how long we took making that mistake. Find out what God's will. I'm not saying that you're something you're doing in your life's wrong, but I'm just telling you this. We ought to be sensitive to say, God, what's your will? What do you want from my life? What do you want in my life? We need to be connected to his will. When we get connected to his will, of course, we'll find that in his word. Amen. 
Amen. You'll find that right in the Word of God. You'll find that through the, the teaching of the Scripture. Sometimes I, I, I wish I could always, when people come and ask me, Preacher, what do you think I ought to do in this situation? I wish I could always tell them, turn to this chapter and turn to that verse, and right there is your answer. But sometimes it's not as simple as black and white. However, the principles of God's Word can guide us uh, the, the, the power of God's word and the power of the spirit of God will help us to get where we need to go. As I begin to think about that, I, uh, I was talking to your mother, Brother John, back there. And she said you had called her this morning, you know, asking if you were going to make it to church. Uh, amen. That's good. Amen. And she said, uh, she told me, she said, Thank God for the blood, she said. Uh, and we were, they were singing that song when she was telling me that. And I said, hallelujah. Brother Robert finally prayed over some songs we were supposed to sing. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> but I got to thinking, how many times God will put you right where you need to be to hear just exactly what you need to hear? This morning, this is not my style at all. Most of you that heard me preach for a while know this. But I know without a doubt that somebody this morning, God's telling you something. God's speaking to you about making a connection. Some of you are on the tattered edge of falling out of the will of God and walking in the ways of God because you're not connected serving him. Oh, you just you just show up here and there. You just sometimes you feel okay. I just I just don't know. It don't seem like I I don't have the friends I used to have. What the Bible say in Proverbs chapter 18? A man that have friends must show himself friendly. It's not always everybody else's job just to come in and hug you up and to be the best friend in the world you ever had, you, you should be friendly as well. <laughs> Amen. Um, getting connected. Connected in the body. They tell me that if somebody makes three friends in a church, they make three friends, the percentage of them staying in that church drastic, I'm talking about multiples and multiples and multiples, if they'll just make three friends. The Bible said this, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. There's some people that, that, that want to come to church and they want to come incognito. They want to come undercover. Uh, they want to come and sit down and then and leave and never get connected. And because you, you may have got hurt somewhere else, uh, something may have happened somewhere else. Uh, I'm not downplaying that. I don't think uh, that... that, that uh, there's a problem with being safe about some things, uh, but after a while, if you're going to do this thing very long uh, and living for God uh, and finding God's will for your life, you're going to have to get connected to the local body of the church. Uh, you're going to have to say, you know what? Uh, I might get hurt. Uh, things might go wrong. Uh, it might be a wreck, uh, but God, here I am, uh, and I want to be connected uh, to what you're doing. Uh, I want to be connected to the people of God. Uh, I want to be connected to your children right here. These are my family. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, this is where we come. Talking about making connections. Can you look around and see God's hand moving pieces in your life? Can you look back and see how God Man, God closed that door there. Man, did he open a door over there? God sure has a way of putting it all together. I uh, I told you about CT. CT's daddy sold out for God. He decided he's just going to go all in with him. Raise the family to do so. His wife Becky, <laughs> Dr. Hurt tells the story when he decided he was going to move, go down to North Augusta to help Dr. Brown. He lived in 
uh, Cape Girardeau, just outside of Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And he loaded up everything he had in an old cattle trailer. And, I mean, meats and everything. Had a sort of freezer that he had to plug in as soon as he got there. And said, drove, drove it down there, pulled up the preacher's yard and said, here I am. I'm ready to work. I'm ready to serve. He raised two daughters that are both married to preachers that are doing great things for God. And I'm watching as they're stepping into another level because they had somebody to make the connection before them. It's easy sometimes the devil will dark will have, have you look at other people and think, well, you're doing the same thing they're doing. Why aren't you getting the blessings they're getting? Because, Brother John, they're standing and they're living in the blessings that somebody else sowed. God told them in the book of Deuteronomy, also the book of Joshua, you're going to live in houses that you did not build. You're going to drink from wells that you did not dig. You're going to eat from vines that you didn't plant. Brother Ronnie, as far as I know, uh, when you started, you kind of started on ground level. We didn't have a whole lot of heritage and all that about people that were uh, holding you up in the things of God. But you decided she was going to follow God. So you decided to raise some boys. And them and their children and their children are living in the blessings of God. You son, that you did, that you done. One of these days, should the Lord tarry his coming, my babies are gonna grow up. I love my mom, I love my dad. But we weren't church going folk. I'll never forget watching hallelujah. Watching my mama walk down from that aisle over there. And she got born again. these days, they're going to get to drink from some wells that, that I made God done. They'll get to go further than I ever went. And that's okay. I want it to happen. I'm going to cheer them on and shout them on when they do. We, uh, several of us, got to go to the Arise Youth Conference this summer. 3,000 plus there. And just an amazing move of God. And I'll be 100% honest with you, Miss Debbie, I wasn't jealous one bit of watching CT up there and Jerry up there just basking in the glory and the blessings of God. Why? Because I know Jared's daddy was faithful and is faithful right now preaching in a church way down in South Georgia where nobody knows his name. But him and his, his son and his two daughters was up there singing the glory down. And I got to thank him. If I can make a connection for somebody else that they can go on and do great things for God. Ethan, one of these days, I know you want to be a basketball star, a football star. You might be, I don't know. But beyond that, I hope, my prayer is that you're a giant for Jesus. I hope God does great things in your life. When he does, I'm going to say, man, I remember on July 21st, 2002, when he got saved, that little brush armor, because we couldn't have a rise, we just did what we could. I, what I'm asking is, are you? John 15 said, 
I am the vine, ye are the branches. Without me, ye can do nothing. Are you connected to him? Are you connected in the work of God? Are you just a, well, I, I'll come. I won't be bothered with it all. I'll come. Miss Phyllis, I was talking to a, somebody. I'm not, I'm not calling you out or anything right here. But I was talking to a, a friend of mine that's he's, he's raised and got saved in the Church of Nazareth. I said, some of the best people I know at our church were, uh, come from the Church of the Nazareth. I said, they never have joined my church. And that's okay. I ain't never twisted your arm to do it, and I won't ever do it. But they're highly involved in what we do around here. Get connected. I don't care if we put your name down on the church roll. If you saved and you know Jesus, you can serve Jesus right here. Amen. Get connected to doing what God wants to do. I want you to stand with me. I, I know it's been different this morning. But maybe this morning, I, we'll do it like this. How many of us will come and gather around and say, God, I want to thank you for the connection that was made for me at Calvary. Come on. God, I want to thank you that I'm saved by grace. Uh, some of us are first-generation Christians. Some of us didn't have a mom and daddy to carry us to church. Uh, some of us weren't raised around the things of God. Some of us were, and maybe you just want to come and say, Thank you, God. I was raised uh, uh, to know the things of God. Uh, I was raised by a mom and daddy that would pray for me, uh, that loved me, uh, and that would sacrifice for me. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, maybe there's others that say, God, uh, by your grace, if you'll let me, uh, if you'll help me, Lord, I want to go on uh, and I want to do uh, everything I can for your glory. Oh, God. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Oh, God, we need you. While these are praying, maybe somebody say, Preacher, I, I need to get connected into serving God. I'm, I'm not going to sit on the sidelines no more. I want to get connected into serving God. How many would just say, Preacher, I want to do more for my Lord than I'm doing? Here's my hand. Let's see those hands all over the building. Here's my hand. Thank you. Lord, I want to do more for you than I, what I've been doing. God, help me to serve you. While these are praying, you're here this morning to say, Preacher, I'm not I'm not where I need to be in my relationship with God. Oh, I'm saved. But I'm not, I'm not in the perfect will of God for my life. I need some help. Would you be honest enough? Here's my hand, preacher. Would you pray for me? Here's my hand. Help me, God. I want to be 100% in your perfect will for my life. You're here this morning say, Preacher, I'm not 100% sure that I'm saved. I do not know without a doubt that I'm saved. Preacher, please pray for me. Oh God, in Jesus' name, Lord, I ask you that you touch and help, bless. God, work in our hearts and work in our lives. Speak to us this time we have together. Help us, God, that we leave differently than we came. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <sighs> Praise the Lord. Let's do this uh, this morning. Uh, Allison, come on. Jennifer, you probably need to help me with getting the words for that song. She probably don't remember that. Uh, can you find that song, uh, John, over there? You got it. All right. Not guilty. And uh, she's going to come sing this. We're going to take the offering right after that. Remember, 
uh, we're going to have a special offering. Uh, we, we were able to do uh, about half of what we need to be uh, for the legal uh, uh, fees for those children. Uh, and to, this is the Sunday that we wanted to finish that up. And so if you will, uh, you want to give toward that, this means just have a bucket or something uh, when we do that. And she's going to come around and sing this song. How many of you are glad to see Miss Allison? Listen and uh, let the Lord help. Yeah. 